Thank you, and I'm happy to be here presenting today on this topic, which is going to walk through and show us a little bit about how we can um, understand if a child might have ADHD, and then if you think that it is a possibility, how to talk to your doctor about it. This is how that you can um, get in contact with the folks at Chad. If there's anything after this presentation today that you feel uh, you'd like to follow up on or gather more information from. There's a ton of resources on the website that can go even further into detail about the topic that we're gonna discuss today. And these are my disclosures. So I have received funding currently or recently from um, these sources, whether it's for part of my research or um, related to my clinical uh, services and training of others. So the first question a person um, might ask themselves if they're trying to determine if their child could have ADHD and if this is something worth raising to a professional is to understand what the symptoms of ADHD are and to think a little bit about whether you're seeing a pattern of these behaviors in your child. ADHD is a disorder that professionals consider to be heterogeneous. So that means that no two people with ADHD look exactly alike. And as a result, it would be very rare for a person with ADHD to experience all 18 of the symptoms of the disorder. In fact, when you're diagnosing ADHD in a child, you're only required to have six of the symptoms in order to uh, be somebody who can qualify for having the disorder. So I wanna just familiarize folks for a second um, about the symptoms of ADHD. We have them divided here into sections. And in the guidelines that professionals use for ADHD diagnosis, they look at the two lists, the inattention list and the hyperactivity impulsivity list. And they um, are going to try to determine whether this child meets enough symptoms off of those lists for the difficulties to be considered um, to be meaningful. So on the inattention list, uh, if you take a look, you're going to see symptoms that cover a few different areas. So everyone thinks about attention when they think about ADHD and attention problems, but really ADHD is a lot broader than just problems paying attention. And in fact, there are some people with ADHD who don't actually have problems paying attention. So we're looking for people who are tr having trouble controlling their attention, controlling their thoughts, and controlling their behavior. And this can look like different things. So it could be that people are having trouble uh, paying attention and listening to adults when they're speaking. It could be difficulty sustaining attention for a long period of time, being able to sit down and do seat work for an extended period of time without needing to get up and move around or getting interested in other things. It could be that somebody has trouble keeping their stuff um, neat, trouble with organization of uh, materials, trouble of organization of thoughts, of organization of time. And another piece of ADHD related to the inattention symptoms is trouble recruiting your own effort to work on boring or difficult tasks. So um, people who don't like to um, sit down and do work that isn't super fun. Kids also with ADHD often experience forgetfulness. So this could look like losing things or not remembering that you had to do something or that you were supposed to talk to a teacher. So these are some of the common symptoms of inattention that you might see in a person with ADHD. In addition, we have the list of hyperactive impulsive symptoms. More people with ADHD experience the inattentive symptoms some people experience the hyperactive impulsive symptoms only, but many people with the hyperactive impulsive symptoms also experience the inattention symptoms. And so we have different subtypes of ADHD, which is something that um, you may learn more about if you talk about this with your doctor. But the hyperactive impulsive symptoms are interesting. So when children are younger, they're much more visible. So in uh, elementary school age children, you know, you often see fidgeting, uh, running around a lot, difficulty, you know, remaining seated, just having kind of uncontrolled energy, difficulties being quiet when you need to be quiet. And again, ADHD is really a disorder of self-control. So you see self-control both um, cognitively or with, you know, thinking and, and paying attention. And then you see the self-control with the behavior as well. So one symptom of ADHD that you may have heard about is acting like you're driven by a motor. So kind of being nonstop all the time, talking a lot, and the impulsive symptoms, which include, you know, um, speaking quickly without thinking, 
blurting out the answers to things for a teacher, maybe before they've been asked or interrupting people a lot, difficulty, you know, taking turns. So it's an impatience that often um, accompanies these impu impulsive um, symptoms. But as somebody gets older, so into middle school and high school, if you have an older child, who you're considering an ADHD diagnosis for, you're gonna see less of these hyperactive, visibly hyperactive symptoms, and maybe more of the impulsive symptoms. And especially, I think in the older kids, you see um, these symptoms about avoiding tasks that require sustained mental effort. That's a symptom that actually has something to do with the impulsive symptoms as well as the inattentive symptoms, and that's a very prominent symptom in older kids. This is an important slide to me. So after, you know, understanding whether your child is experiencing the cluster of behaviors that are associated with ADHD, that's not all it takes to get a diagnosis of ADHD. And the reason for this is that all of us have experienced some of those symptoms at some time in our life, because it's normal to sometimes um, have trouble with your cognition or your attention or your behavior, or your self-control. That's part of being a human being. Um, but we have to understand for a person with ADHD, is this a really pervasive, always happening across the board experience of symptoms that are really getting in the way of somebody being able to function in a normal way? So the first question after assessing if those symptoms are present that a doctor or provider is going to be hopefully asking is whether those symptoms are actually leading to meaningful difficulties for your child. We can imagine there are children who have symptoms of ADHD, children who are hyper, who are, talk a lot, who are excitable, kids who you know don't like to stay seated. But in spite of that, they still do well in school. They still have friends, people like them. They don't have any relationship issues with adults. They generally are good kids who listen, but they just need a little extra um, maybe support in kind of you know staying on task. If if that's the case for a child, we would not say they have ADHD because they don't have meaningful impairments in their life because of the symptoms. They may have a very mild um, tendency towards ADHD, but they would not meet criteria for it as a disorder because a disorder really means that somebody has really big difficulties or challenges in their life. So what does impairment look like? So if your child has the symptoms of ADHD on the last slide, and they also have things like poor grades in school, difficult relationships with teachers, inability to get their work done in a reasonable amount of time, difficulties with socially with making and keeping friends or getting along with others in the neighborhood or in class, if they have trouble completing their responsibilities around the house without lots and lots of reminders and prompts, if they have trouble getting along with their siblings or strained relationships with adults, parents, these are the types of difficulties that providers are looking for to consider an ADHD diagnosis. So you have to have both sort of the behaviors and those behaviors need to be linked to meaningful um, difficulties in a person's life. If those meaningful difficulties are there, the other thing that a provider will be checking out is whether or not these symptoms are only restricted to one setting. Let's say, unfortunately, your child got the most challenging fourth grade teacher and they have been fine in school up until this point. But with this teacher, there's stress, there's grades that are bad but don't feel justified. You know, there's getting into it with the teacher because they may be stern or they may not be kind. Um, these are difficulties that may be restricted to just that one teacher's class. In this situation, we would not give a diagnosis of ADHD because ADHD should really be something that is going on for a person no matter what the situation. It should be something that you're experiencing both at home and at school, both with peers, you know, and in extracurriculars. So we're really looking that if this is something that is, you know, specific to your child and not really just influenced by the environment that they're in. We're also going to be trying to find out if the symptoms are kind of a chronic ongoing over time, right? So it both has to be regardless of place and regardless of time. So sometimes we don't notice the symptoms until someone's a little bit older. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't look back and say, you know what, they were always kind of like this, right? But if the symptoms seem to come out of the blue, 
if they were spontaneous, if they're very recent, then that would not be enough for an ADHD diagnosis. And hopefully in that case, the provider would monitor your child for a while to see if they go away or to see if they continue or get worse in order to understand, is this a chronic difficulty that the person's always kind of had, or is this something that might be um, specific to something that happened? And it is the case that ADHD-like symptoms can be triggered by other things, and then it wouldn't actually be ADHD, it would be the other thing. So for example, I already mentioned the difficult teacher um, situation. Sometimes kids get put in very demanding environments, kids who are in too many extracurriculars, really difficult schools, um, have a lot of demands on them. If those symptoms of ADHD are really only showing up because of the increased demands in the kid's life, um, you know, we would say that the solution is to decrease the demand on the kid and then see if they still were experiencing the ADHD symptoms. But sometimes stress or big changes, you know, parents getting divorced, moving, those types of things can trigger some ADHD symptoms in kids. Usually in those cases, the symptoms are gonna be temporary until the stressors um, resolved or they get kids get used to the changes. So if symptoms come up in those situations, we would not think that that's ADHD. Um, and so sometimes we have to wait and see what happens for kids um, when they're first experiencing those symptoms. Other things like depression or sadness, anxiety, and things like unhealthy lifestyle. So kids who are on screens all day, not getting any exercise, um, very sedentary can experience some of these behaviors. If there's abuse going on um, at home or with um, somebody else, then that also can trigger these types of behaviors. So a good ADHD evaluation should be getting to know your child's world enough that they can ask all these questions, rule everything out, and make sure that we're really sure that this is ADHD. So um, I think it's great for parents to know this information so that when they go into a conversation with a medical professional, they're empowered with exactly what the medical professional is doing or should be doing. And the honest truth is that there's a lot of different um, approaches that medical professionals take to diagnosing ADHD. And I think most people do a great job. They're very thorough when they, um, some doctors don't specialize in ADHD. Some primary care doctors that you might be most likely to come into contact with don't specialize in ADHD, but they do the responsible thing and they would refer you to someone who does. So that that thorough evaluation can occur. But sometimes as a parent, it's really good to be on the lookout for people who give quick, easy ADHD diagnoses based on a quick conversation. That would not be a thorough ADHD diagnosis. And if you ever find yourself in that situation, it would be great to empower yourself to seek a second opinion and make sure your child really does get the close look at what's going on so that you can have the right answer. And that would lead to the right treatment. Because you can imagine that if you get it wrong, it could be a different approach altogether that would help your child, and then we're, we're not doing that, right? So if you have a child who has a history of trauma or some really big stressors happened in the last year and they got the ADHD diagnosis, um, that's not going to help resolve those stressors and help your child cope with that, right? So we need to make sure that we identify the right difficulties so we can get kids the right help. So I think that it's important to think about um, what are some smart things to say to the medical professional when you first meet with them? And usually I'm going to give you guys some ideas here. And I think every conversation could look a little different. So you could take the pieces of this that you feel like are would fit best for your doctor and your situation. But you want to go in and you want to be really good at describing about what's going on, right? So you want to describe what's concerning you about your child's behavior across those settings, right? Because we know that that's an important piece to describe that it's not just that one fourth grade teacher. Where are you seeing the difficulties? You also could share where they're doing well, right? Because it, of course kids with ADHD are gonna do well in some areas and especially when they have certain strengths. And it's important for, I think, doctors to see the contrast between what situations are hard for your kid and what situations are easy. And sometimes that can help us see patterns that help us understand exactly what's going on. 
It's important also if there is a family history of ADHD that makes you suspect ADHD that you share that with the doctor. Just because ADHD runs in your family doesn't mean that your child's behaviors are ADHD, but sometimes just understanding that full picture can help doctors sort of see patterns that could help them, you know, come to the right conclusion in the end. And I also think it's really important to take notes on this whole process. So A, taking notes about your child's behavior and having that organized when you go meet with the doctor can be a real asset because you know when that information is organized for us, it's easier for us to kind of go through it and and go get into the hard part, which is like, you know, really making an analysis of what's going on. But also writing down um, what happens in the appointment and taking notes can be really helpful too for yourself so that you kind of keep a list of what it's going on in this process if you end up being referred to for a second opinion or a specialist you know to not have to reinvent the wheel is really great so usually the first point of contact about adhd possible diagnosis is the pediatrician or your um, primary care provider for your child that's a great place to just start and ask what they would recommend if you have suspicion of adhd so uh, sometimes they'll say we can we can make that diagnosis in our office, and sometimes they'll say they prefer and are more comfortable referring you to a specialist. The specialists who are most equipped to make ADHD diagnoses depends on your community. Different communities are sort of like giving this responsibility to different types of professionals, but usually a psychologist is probably your number one because they are going to be equipped to really do all the testing and all of the um, information gathering that's needed to make a good ADHD diagnosis. However, um, psychiatrists will also sometimes uh, take this task on, but usually a psychiatrist is going to be focused mostly on um, medication treatment, which means that they may restrict the information that they gather to be, uh, you know, specific to whether or not it, medication is indicated. Um, they, they don't do things like IQ testing, right, or other academic or um, social emotional information gathering to get the whole picture of a child's difficulties. There are also emerging specialists in the medical field like developmental behavioral pediatricians, behavioral neurologists, who also often make ADHD diagnoses. And sometimes you'll find clinics that take a team approach, which is great, where you have like a psychologist, a psychiatrist, and maybe a neurologist or a pediatrician working together to all kind of look at um, the piece of the picture. And I think, again, like I mentioned before, some doctors conduct proper ADHD evaluations and some don't. So it's really important for you to feel like you have the information you need to determine that piece. If it's a good ADHD evaluation, the doctors will have you fill out questionnaires about your child's behavior. They should also give you questionnaires for your child's teacher to complete or other adults in your child's life, whether it be, you know, a baseball coach or it be um, another family member like an aunt or a grandparent who spends a lot of time with your child. Um, so this is what you would expect. They're going to hopefully gather perspectives of multiple people to understand the behaviors that your child shows in different settings. They also should do an interview with you for at least 30 minutes, if not more, to get a full history of your child's behavior. They should be asking you those questions that we went over previously about impairment, about the timing of symptoms, the setting they occur in, how long they've been going on. And they should also be asking you about other physical um, or mental health disorders that your child might be experiencing that could also mimic ADHD, right? And so you want to make sure that they're not just going down the 18 symptoms on the first slide. You want to make sure they're really looking at the full picture here. Sometimes um, neurologists or other doctors will give uh, like computer tasks that um, are designed to measure attention as part of the ADHD diagnosis. And I think it's important to know while these um, tasks can be helpful uh, pieces of information, those tasks are not a way of diagnosing ADHD because they, are, they have a lot of false positives. So there's a lot of people who show up as having attention problems on them that actually don't have them in real life. 
And there can be false negatives too, like people who have attention problems who ace those tests. So I just wanted to also bring that up. If you have, if you ever meet with a doctor who just, you know, gives your kid a quick computer task and decides whether they have ADHD or not, that would also not be a thorough diagnostic evaluation. So when you meet with the um, doctor, there are some questions that you can ask that I think will help you also empower yourself to make sure you're in the right hands and also to um, promote a good evaluation of your child. So you may wanna ask uh, questions about their training background, you know, what approach they take to ADHD assessment, just upfront from the get-go. So before they do these steps, you can find out what's happening and make sure it's the right person for you. You also may wanna hear about whether they specialize in ADHD or not. And this might especially be a good question if you're in a pediatrician's office where some of them do a great job with it and others, you know, don't. So, um, you know, asking kind of whether they're comfortable treating ADHD in their practice, what an assessment would look like. And, and you can ask like, what else would you be considering for these symptoms besides just ADHD? Maybe as a way of finding out if they are gonna go with that just quick, you know, fill out this checklist approach versus the full picture, which we really wanna encourage those um, evaluations that get at the full picture. Finally, another question could be understanding, how will you know if my child has enough problems to get the ADHD diagnosis? We talked about impairment earlier. We wanna make sure that um, you know, the doctors are being judicious about only giving the disorder to kids who really qualify for it. Another few questions that could be useful to ask, uh, you know, finding out how long this will take. Uh, it should, if a thorough uh, evaluation should take a few hours all in all, right? So it shouldn't just be something quick. Do you screen for conditions that look like ADHD and coexisting conditions? Uh, what information do you need um, when you do an evaluation? What are they going to be collecting? Will they collect the teacher ratings? And then at the end of an evaluation, you should get a written summary of uh, everything they found, whether they diagnose ADHD in the end or not. And that summary will also have recommendations at the end that will help you know what your next steps are. So again, if you're going and getting an ADHD evaluation and they, there isn't a plan to give you, you know, a summary of everything and, and make sure you get like a full report, that may not be a thorough um, ex uh, evaluation. After you get diagnosed, a few pieces that could be recommended to you, depending probably on your child's age and what's available in your community, but getting education on ADHD for both you and your child is an important piece of treatment so that everyone understands you know, what to expect and what the disorder means. Behavior therapy and medication are the two evidence-based treatments for ADHD. And whether you decide to pursue one, the other, or the combination of the two is really a personal decision. They're both helpful. Behavior therapy, can be a lot of work for the family, um, but it pays off big time if you put in the work, right? To get good habits going, both for how parents set up structure in their home and for how kids can develop new skills and habits to succeed. And that can be really a long-term great, you know, thing to participate in. Um, medication can be very effective and, you know, kind of in the moment, helping kids focus when they're doing things like work and, and have better control of their behavior and their, their attention and their thoughts. So they're both really effective, but they, they do different things. Uh, another piece is collaborating with the school. So um, if you're in the US, you know, you, your child can be entitled to services at school based on the fact that they have ADHD. And there's a whole process there that you can um, initiate with the school to pursue that. I'm just going to close with a few tips about how to have a conversation with the doctor. We talked about what to talk about, but maybe just the best way to approach the doctor to hopefully engage them and hopefully make the evaluation be successful. Start by appreciating something about the doctor. Um, the reason I think it's important to start out with a really positive interaction here is I think depending on if you're already meeting with a specialist or you're, you're meeting with your pediatrician and raising this for the first time, I think that sometimes the topic of ADHD assessment can, especially if you're going to be asking them things like, what are your, what are your, what are your qualifications? You know, you, you don't want them to think that you're questioning whether they can do this or not, right? Because they, they are professionals who've invested a lot in their training and have a lot of experience. So, you know, I think it's always good to start off on a good foot, especially if you're going to be possibly, you know, evaluating or scrutinizing whether or not the doctor is actually going to be capable of, of doing the evaluation. 
asking them, you know, from the get-go, can we talk about ADHD for a second today? Especially if you're in a primary care visit that was for something else and you're raising it kind of as a secondary part of the conversation. It's always good to make sure that the doctor's not in a rush trying to get out the door when you're trying to raise this, what's for you a very important question. So you wanna make sure that they, you know, have your attention, that, sorry, that you have their attention, that they are willing to take a minute to talk about ADHD with you, check in with them before you launch into it. And then I would recommend asking open-ended questions when you're um, talking to the doctor about rather than yes, no questions in order to really get the answers you're looking for. So something like what's your team's comfort level diagnosing ADHD is better than, you know, do you guys diagnose ADHD here? Or is your team comfortable diagnosing ADHD? You'll get a better, longer, more descriptive answer. You know, instead of do you use rating scales, something like what tools do you use to assess ADHD? You know, how would we engage the teacher in the process versus will you get teacher ratings? So this will get the doctor talking and hopefully get you more information. Also, sometimes people can feel rushed or emotional when describing stressful, you know, things that are going on at home. So just trying to be neutral and descriptive and open to the to the possibility that your child either does or doesn't have ADHD when you're um, talking to the doctor, right? So some examples on here, just describing what you're noticing. I'm noticing Rachel's taking a lot of time to get through very simple homework assignments and her teacher's been complaining to me that she isn't following instructions at school. How possible is it that these behaviors could be related to ADHD, right? Or I think my relationship with Omar is becoming very strained because he's so forgetful around the house and needs me to be on top of him just to get through the day. His other siblings aren't like that. Would it be worth having him evaluated for ADHD? Next, if you think that you're getting a good feeling from the doctor that this is going to be somebody who seems like they'll give a good ADHD evaluation, make sure that you leave the office knowing what the next steps are. So sometimes you can move things along by like getting the teacher forms or the parent rating skills that day, even if you're you know, going to schedule a follow-up for the evaluation in a month or something. You can get a head start. You may want to ask up front, is there information I can be bringing to that assessment that I'm scheduling right now? Should I start gathering past report cards? You know, should I be looking for um, last year's teacher, trying to get back in touch with them? So, you know, thinking about just kind of being proactive about gathering the information because the the richer the information and the more organized the information that you can provide to the doctor, the more likely it is that they're going to come to the correct conclusion because they have more to look at, more to see the patterns. And then the other piece is if you don't think that the doctor is going to be the right fit based on this initial conversation, and that might be a primary care doctor who you know, you weren't sure to begin with if they could have done a good job or you sometimes you may get referred to a specialist that after talking to them, you know, you realize that they're not necessarily following the national guidelines on what an ADHD evaluation could be. There are people out there who build themselves as specialists in ADHD, but aren't necessarily following best practices. So if you're not feeling like the best practices are going to be followed in um, the setting that you're seeking the evaluation, you know, you can, it's okay to ask for another referral or to just, you know, pursue someone else. So I think if you're going to be in primary care, uh, you know, you can just ask to be referred to a specialist. And I don't think that that is an, at all like a um, insulting thing to, to say to a doctor. And if you're going that route, I get the name of a few different people for a couple reasons. First of all, in some areas of the country, there are very long wait lists, unfortunately, to get ADHD evaluations. And so, you know, having three or four different names can get you on a few different wait lists and hopefully, you know, see who opens up something soonest. In addition, there is, I think, a mixed bag of people out there who some people are following guidelines in diagnosing ADHD and some people aren't, right? Because like, unlike with um, doctors, physicians who, treat physical disorders, you know, treating mental disorders, mental health difficulties, there isn't like um, really strict rules about how you have to do things that can be enforced by anybody. So, you know, in some senses, there's a lot of people out there doing kind of what they like to do, but not necessarily doing what's, what's being recommended by the professional practice bodies. So um, most people do a good job, but if you find yourself with someone that you don't think is 
the right fit, you know, you can therefore have more names and people to talk to and to check out. And like I mentioned earlier, make sure that they're planning to give you a report at the end because that report becomes a very powerful document for you and your child. You can take it to the school to get them services. You can take it back to your primary care doctor to, uh, you know, initiate the conversation about medication. Those reports also can be really helpful in helping you know in your community what other resources are available for people with ADHD. So if you're going to invest all the time and effort into it, make sure you're getting, you know, what you're either paying for or what you're investing your time into. Sometimes you can find the ADHD evals that can be covered by insurance. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes you have to pay out of pocket for them. So that really depends on your community and how things work with your insurance. But these are all important questions, I think, to, to find out ahead of time so you can make a good plan for yourself. So thank you so much for uh, being a part of this webinar. Uh, again, if you have information that you're interested in pursuing beyond what we have in this webinar today, you can go online, find out from Chad a lot more about resources for pursuing an ADHD diagnosis. And also we encourage you all to check out Attention Magazine as well, which is Chad's publication for parents and people with ADHD that you know, always kind of keeps bringing the latest, newest resources and information about ADHD um, to the forefront for the community. So this is another great resource as well. Dr. Sibley, thank you so much for your presentation, for being with us this morning and uh, for your time and your efforts on behalf of the ADHD community. I think this has been very helpful. Thank you, it was great to be here.